welcome back to my channel thank you so much for being here and i really appreciate your time so i just wanted to really briefly give my thoughts on this entire situation with uh, megan and prince harry having their interview with oprah being very candid very open um talking about what her experiences have been you know thus far being a part of the royal family or not really being a part of the royal family. So what really, I guess, inspired me to make this video was a tweet that I came across um, the, uh, yesterday and it says basically, well, this is exactly what it says. I also wonder like if Megan's experiences as a light-skinned biracial woman made her naive about the ways she'd be treated by the royal family, but by the tabloids, not only by the royal family, but by the tabloids and the British people in general. And so I thought this, tweet was extremely extremely relevant um not just to like the kinds of ideas that i was having on my own this conversation basically at least for me because i shared this tweet uh this picture of this tweet in many groups that i was in as well as some of the some of the groups i was in were already having this kind this kind of discussion um i think it's just really relevant because a lot of times what i realized when it comes to uh colorism discussions is that there will be this cognitive dissonance with um, either biracial folks who identify as black and who have an racially who have a racially ambiguous look or phenotype rather, and light skinned black people who benefit from colorism because of their skin tone. So if you're not understanding what I'm basically trying to say, this is what I'm this is why this topic is so important. Because now we are having conversations or discussions about colorism in a way that we haven't before uh because this biracial woman brought it up and it's as simple as that colorism is oftentimes a topic that is while you know things have de things are definitely better um it's still very much relegated to being like oh it's a personal problem you're just the ugly dark skin girl like you don't really you know colorism is not a real thing like it's all in your head right this is what happens when particularly dark skinned women begin to discuss colorism. We are gaslighted, we are dismissed. But now people are talking, you know, black people are talking about obviously Megan's comments when, you know, she told Oprah that Harry relayed to her that their baby skin tone, you know, was discussed in terms of their being concerned for how dark uh archie was going to be obviously triggered a lot of black people to begin talking about this on social media and discussing you know how bad this is and what i think a lot of people missed is that what she was talking about is colorism right she's talking about that in the societies that we live in globally this is not just an american concept in the society that we globally participate in the social contract that we globally participate in proximity to whiteness in terms of your skin tone and your facial features your, the way your facial features appear on your face your phenotype you are deemed as more valuable more intelligent uh just better in general the closer you are to white and that is why to use a <laughs> morgan's language a senior older royal family member would be concerned about okay is this gonna be a a light-skinned biracial person or is this gonna be a dark-skinned biracial person because if the person is in fact a light-skinned biracial person that has a set of phenotype uh, of, of phenotypical features that allows them to be white passing then that's okay it's okay if they're white passing however if they end up looking more ethnic more black that's a problem and that is colorism that is colorism there was basically this discussion happening you know in the groups that i was in on facebook and on you know social media in general of okay so this is bad right so we all agree that this is bad this is really 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 gross to be concerned about how dark a child's going to come out but we don't seem to have this same collective ew that's gross mindset when it comes to colorism in general in the black community. So what I was running into was a lot of light skin or biracial uh, people who, who were racially ambiguous, uh, not understanding why uh, the topic of colorism 
is different from racism, right? In the most simplest terms, I will say that colorism is a person's proximity to whiteness and racism is a person's proximity to blackness. Again, the social, the global social construct, con contract that we all oftentimes participate in. Colorism is not an American problem. Colorism is not um, a South American problem. It is not um, a Canadian problem. It is not an Asian problem. It is not an Australian. Like colorism is global because colonization was global, and you know slavery was global. So. Oftentimes, you know, the person on top is going to establish themselves as the standard, right? So that is why globally, the closer a person of color is to whiteness, the more value they have. Again, light-skinned biracial people and these discussions that I was participating in were was not understanding why there needs to be a distinction between colorism and racism. They weren't they weren't understanding why there is a distinction there. The tweet is basically saying, had Meghan Markle been a non-ambiguous biracial person of color, she may have been more prepared to deal with the royals and their blatant racism and colorism because she would have been used to it. And possibly the reason why she was not prepared or not used to it is because she is a lighter skinned, racially ambiguous biracial person who moves through the world as white passing, okay? So what that statement basically means is because Meghan Markle does not look like an obvious black person. And to me, when I first saw her, I thought she was a, a white Latina. That's what I thought she was. I did not think she was even black, even mixed with black. So because she has been able to move through you know, the world being white passing, she has not experienced people treating her as number one, black, and number two, the bad kind of black. She hasn't experienced this. So while, you know, there's other aspects, obviously, of being a part of the royal family that was probably difficult, was probably uncomfortable and strange and weird. And part of what Princess Diana also had a difficult time doing it because she was human, she was emotional, she was expressive. There was definitely an issue there that particularly I think Meghan faced because she, to the royal family, she is not only black, but she is just to them basically she's not she is not see in the black community racially ambiguous in particular racially ambiguous biracial people are put on the pedestal so a lot of times biracial people will come to our community for their self-esteem because they understand that in our community, their hair texture is praised, their racially ambiguous features are praised. If they have light eyes, that's praised. All these things about them that make them stand out from regular black people, non-ambiguous black people, they receive praise for that. From not just family members, but people outside of their family. When they go to school, when they're at work, when they're dating, when they're in college. For many, many, many years, they experience praise for looking non-black. But then when they go to the white community, they're quickly reminded, like, you're not special. <laughs> you're not white like us. And so to be around people who are not only probably blatantly racist, but very much like um, showing adversion to her being a person of color and to her being black, that probably, I, I just believe, I don't know for sure, <laughs> but I just believe in my heart that she was not used to that type of treatment. She was not used to being, to her to, to her proximity to blackness being a problem. In these discussions, I kept finding myself face, you know, con you know conversing with uh, racially ambiguous biracial people or light-skinned black people who did not understand why I was making the distinction. And they kept going back to, okay, well, I, I still experience racism. I still experience, you know, discrimination. I still blah, 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 blah. blah. And they couldn't understand why I kept saying to them in response, but you still benefit from colorism, but you still benefit from colorism. And I think the reason why is because a lot of times black people have this very strange notion of, oh, well, to white people, we all black as if 
white people's racist ability to not be able to distinguish us should be a marker for blackness. I don't know why we continue. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't understand that. Also, I think it's this. It's the. It's the aspect of when you tell a, a, a light-skinned person or a racially ambiguous biracial person that hey, color, col colorism benefits you you are somehow taking away their blackness because a lot of times we understand blackness as struggle right so to say to, to so to say to that person hey you this part of racism this subsidiary of racism called colorism here's where you benefit it's like oh wait 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 whoa whoa no 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 i don't be, no what are you talking about i'm black you know and it's it, there's this immediate aversion to even the possibility of understanding that you do benefit from this that you have privilege in this area. And I don't understand why um, people are not more open to understanding that while you may have adversities, the based off of, again, this these, these, these global social con contracts, there are areas in which you privilege, like you, you have privilege. Like for example, even though I am a dark thin black woman, I am still thin. So I have thin privilege in regards to matching how I match up to um, conventional beauty standards um, when it comes to natural hair. I do not have extremely kinky 4C hair. I, I'm more, my natural hair texture more so falls in line with uh, 4B, uh, 3, 3C, like that's my, that's my hair texture. So, and so under colorism, you know, there's this thing called texturism and featureism. So in the spectrum of texturism, I have privilege because I don't have kinky hair. And so there is a set of struggles that are unique to their experience that I don't experience. And admitting that I have these privileges does not take away from my blackness. It doesn't take away from how I don't benefit from colorism. What I think is important to biracial or light-skinned people who are watching this video is to understand that it's not we're not saying that you're bad or we're not we're not saying that it's your fault that you benefit from colorism it's just more so understanding that you do as an adult having so much appreciation for my mom the older i get is because i was raised by a light-skinned woman and whenever i you know when i first started having issues concerning colorism and i bought them to my mom she was never dismissive she listened to me and she found ways to strengthen my self-esteem. And I'm so grateful for that because what if she was one of these light-skinned people that I was talking to yesterday that were like, oh, it's no such thing. Like, I, you know, we all experience racism. It's all the same. I don't know how I would be. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? If you are a biracial person that is racially ambiguous or a light-skinned black person and you play into colorism, and you enjoy having the privilege, then that is a negative. Then then, then you would be acting on your, you know, the ways in which you benefit from colorism and that is really shitty. It is, uh, it, it is. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's similar to when you're trying to explain to white people how even though they may be on the same social economic status as you and how they may not be rich and how they may not have all the, you know, their life is not amazing. But because they're white, they still benefit from racism and possibly slavery as a whole. It's the same thing. And within that, there are white people who enjoy being white and would never in a million years, no matter how woke they, they consider themselves, they would not trade places with a black person. They would not give up their white privilege. It's not happening. And it's the same way when it comes to colorism and light-skinned people and racially ambiguous uh, um biracial people who benefit from colorism they would not trade places with the dark skinned little girls who grow up hating themselves they would not trade places with the black men who are seeking to breathe themselves out right that's where i think it's your job personally as a light-skinned black person or a racially ambiguous biracial person to examine how you feel about your privileges and to this, you know, decide whether you want to be a part of dismantling colorism because you understand the global damage it does to everyone else, or if you want to continue to, you know, let it rock because you benefit from it. You know, it's it's one of those type of situations. I again think that is why Megan was kind of blindsided because she has not had to move through the world as 
a black person. She hasn't had to. She, I, I just don't think majority of people in her life have looked at her and said, there's a black girl. No, I don't think that's what has happened. Uh, please comment below if you feel me, if you hear where I'm coming from. If not, you can comment as well. <laughs> um, thank you so much for watching and take care. Bye.